The numbers are staggering. More than 6 million Ukrainians have fled their country, escaping the violence of the Russian invasion. While many have scattered throughout the world, it's been the neighboring countries that have seen the bulk of refugees. Poland has been essential in absorbing this population, but it's also playing a major role in keeping Ukraine's agricultural sector alive and making sure small and medium-sized Ukrainian-owned businesses stay afloat. We see Ukraine lost about 40% of its GDP last year only. 40%. Imagine our countries losing that significant part of the economy. So companies urgently need to internationalize, and they do it via Poland. Poland's role in helping Ukraine's businesses now and in the future that's just ahead. Hello and welcome to MOVA, the business language for the new Ukraine, a podcast from the Center for International Private Enterprise, where we'll explore what's happening with business and the economy in Ukraine. I'm Andrew Wilson, Sipes Executive Director, and joining us today is Marcin Nowatsky, the Vice President of the Polish Union of Entrepreneurs and Employers. He's here to give us a perspective from the Polish side of the border on how things are going in Ukraine's agricultural supply chain with the challenges that are facing it, especially now that we're looking at a breakdown of the Russian-Ukrainian grain deal and the need to start moving shipments back through continental Europe. So what we're gonna talk about today are some of the short-term and longer-term things that can be done to strengthen Ukraine's agricultural supply chain. So welcome to you, Marcin. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Marcin Nowatsky. I represent uh, the Polish, one of the Polish largest business organizations, the PP, the Union of Entrepreneurs and Employers. Uh, I'm also linked to one of the largest Polish think tanks, the Warsaw Enterprise Institute. And we're glad to, at ZPP, we're glad to, to partner with Saib for, I think, two years now with regards to the work in Ukraine. Martin, prior to the war, agriculture accounted for 20% of Ukraine's GDP and was its most valuable export. What impact has the war had on exports? And what's the current state of Ukraine's agricultural exports? Let me refer to some numbers. Ukraine is a global supplier of grain. In 2022, uh, the wheat production of Ukraine was 20 million tons, comparing to uh, 2021, where it was uh, 32 million tons. The difference is of one third less last year only, comparing to 2021, so before the large invasion started. It's similar in corn production. In 2022, the production was 21 million tons. And before the war, it was twice as much, 41 million tons in 2021. So the, the production itself is, of course, much smaller because of territories being invaded. But also in terms of it's because of financial limitations of some of Ukrainian farmers. Since the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the role of the Polish-Ukrainian border has changed significantly. I would imagine it's going to continue to evolve unless a new shipment deal can be made to help move grain back through the uh, Black Sea and the Bosphorus. Can you please tell us about some of the biggest changes that you've seen and what challenges you're facing transporting agricultural products from Ukraine to Poland and, and maybe even across to the EU itself? You're right. Uh, Poland has become one of the leading suppliers and fundamental uh, uh, logistics base for Ukraine. It's a base in, for military equipment, humanitarian aid, the reception of uh, refugees, but we also become the main border for Ukraine's export, mostly in the area of agriculture, but also other products. Of course, of course, grain right now is a critical asset to be transported. The main volume of this process is carried out by rail. The volume is so significant that the road transport cannot make it alone. This means that it is a complex operation. It requires facilities in reloading terminals and the availability of containers and the railway platforms. Ukraine has a different format of railway trucks, the so-called white truck. 
and loads must be reloaded at railway terminals onto narrow gauge platforms, so-called European gauge system. We held companies in the relations with terminal owners, and we also support them in the kind of efficiency of cargo rotation for agricultural products. The good thing is that we still have the capacity in Poland to transit more grain from Ukraine via Poland to third countries. There are some difficulties in terms of business operations and business processes because large Ukrainian farmers used to sell the grain in the harbor. So basically they transported the grain to the harbor, to some of the Ukrainian harbors. Right now, they are asking and they want to sell the grain on the Polish-Ukrainian land border, which creates a number of troubles because Poland alone is a net exporter of grain, especially corn and wheat. Uh, that's why we are so focused on the transit of Ukrainian grain via Poland, via Polish harbors, mainly Gdańsk, to other countries. But we are asking Ukrainians not to sell the grain on the border because it's, it doesn't make sense in the longer perspective. We must uh, have the final client, final recipient of the grain at the time it leaves Ukraine. One issue I think we're just starting to shed a little light on here is that the farming communities and the bordering countries that are receiving or might receive this grain are getting a little upset about this. Can you talk a little bit about the political questions around the movement of grain and how your solution will help resolve that. Yeah, so we have five neighboring countries. Poland is the leader, Slovakia, Hungary, and then Romania and Bulgaria is, is not neighboring anymore, but they are all involved in the transit operations. And they are all large producers of agricultural products. Not as, as large as Poland, of course, we are, we are one of the leading markets in the EU. But all of them, once uh, we have the perspective that Ukrainian farmers like agriculture holdings want to sell the grain by the border, they have tensions and troubles with domestic markets. Our market in Poland is different, very different than Ukrainian. Our agriculture consists of number of small farmers with the average farm of about seven, eight hectares. Whereas in Ukraine, you have large 50,000 hectares or even 500,000 hectares. So the, the capacity is different and of the, the, the scale is different. That's why Ukraine is a global supplier. Poland is, is just a net exporter mostly to, to European markets. But if we don't change the business model, the business process, it will create more and more tensions and there won't be a way forward. So we are doing our best to also work with Ukrainian counterparts, with Ukrainian business associations to make sure that uh, once the grain is about to be uh, uh, sent uh, via the land border, it has a final client elsewhere, not in neighboring countries. Then the transit gets easier and again, Poland has the capacity to transit more grain as long as this is the transit, not direct export to Poland. I know you've been advocating both organizational and infrastructural change at the border to help speed up the processing and the moving of this cargo. What specific actions are you and your colleagues proposing that would help the movement of this product faster? So luckily, there are some actions that were already undertaken in terms of uh, organizational changes. The actions to increase the capacity for road cargo transport, for example, the Dorohutsk border has been entirely dedicated to trucks, that there are no individuals crossing this border crossing. There were also new temporarily border crossings opened at the time for handling refugees. In the area of infrastructure, the gaps are the greatest. There is a need to have more border crossings with infrastructure for increased both truck traffic and railway. And here actions have been taken in the form of new road infrastructure, the expansion and reconstruction of border crossings. But again, these actions 
require time and direct investments. It was nine years ago when Poland offered to Ukraine the development loan of 100 million euro for the investment into border crossings on the territory of Ukraine. But unfortunately, this loan haven't been used too much. So we are still lacking a tangible infrastructure in terms of border crossings. The third area of potential changes is uh, what we call kind of, is we know that there are limitations resulting from the fact that Polish-Ukrainian border is also the border of the EU and the border of the Schengen zone of the single market. And, and that creates additional burdens. There are procedures that must be in place. But we really strive to speed up the, the process of handling cargo transports. And hopefully there will be one border crossing chosen by both countries to have a pilot project on joint customs uh, uh, controls. This is really important. We are talking about some of the activities that can be carried out together. We know that because of the Schengen zone and the EU border, some of the activities, some of the, of the operations must be done separately. But still, there is uh, definitely a way to be more efficient in terms of the border crossings. Yeah, I would imagine there's probably short-term things that you can do as well as more complex, longer-term things that must be done. It sounds like you've done the short-term things, such as building extra traffic lanes, clearing stations, that sort of thing, that give more space for cargo to move across the border. But I imagine that there are much more complex issues at play here that, to address that we, when we start talking about the actual flow of trade information between the customs agencies, for instance, because of the different information standards and requirements and all sorts of things like that. For example, I would think digitization of the Polish frontier probably uses a higher and faster standard of digitization of information than perhaps your Ukrainian counterparts might. And that seems to me to be a much longer term exercise that must be undertaken to really facilitate the trade across the border. That's true. What we see right now, I can see the kind of openness of both sides. Even the Polish customs authorities is getting more and more open to, to discuss it and to be flexible. This is really needed. We'd like to see in the future the Polish-Ukrainian border is a very open one where most of processes are coherent and undertaken jointly. We see limitations in terms of the grain. Again, terminals must be involved. The same terminals deal with different uh, sort of, of products. And it is often underlined that the same terminals also are used for military equipment. So of course, there are limitations in terms of the slots. But again, we've been told that there is a capacity to transit much more than right now. The trouble is in the kind of business processing, I would say. I guess I've heard that recently. Last summer, ZPP opened an office in Kiev, and this might help probably facilitate some of these dialogues on the movement of goods across the frontier. Can you share with us some success stories as well as any other upcoming expansion plans your organization might have? You're right. We opened the office last uh, year in July, and the, the aim of the office right now is to assist Ukrainian companies entering uh, Polish European market. Of course, we also, at the same time, uh, the office conducts our relations with the administration and the government of, of Ukraine. As I said, we are focused on, on Ukrainian companies that are looking to, or, uh, to trade their products or looking for new customers in Poland. Some companies enter Poland and the single market with the uh, operations. So we have a, a great success story of a large Ukrainian firm that handles uh, parcels and logistics between uh, Poland and Ukraine. Right now, within a couple of months, they have more than 200 people employed in Poland in different locations. And they provide the service mostly to 3 million Ukrainian customers in Poland. Right now, we have 3 million plus Ukrainians uh, living in Poland. So it's getting close to, to 10% of our population. We are 38 
uh, a million people comes directly. It is an exciting process. We see that Ukraine lost about 40% of its GDP last year only. 40%. Imagine our countries losing that significant part of the economy. So companies urgently need to internationalize. And they do it via Poland. And we, we are glad to be a kind of venue, also a physical venue. We have an open space dedicated for Ukrainian companies that can be used for free. We assist them in finding new clients, uh, new business partners. Just uh, between February and June this year, we provided the service to more than 90 companies, allowing them to enter the Polish markets. It's a large process. It's, the scope is really uh, huge. Just to share numbers, last year, after the war started, till the end of the year, 17,000 Ukrainian companies were registered in Poland. 17,000. This year only, till the end of May, January, May, 13,000 Ukrainian companies are registered in Poland. Are these companies that trade across the frontier, across the border? Some of them trade. Uh, some of them simply come here to register the, the EU entity and to trade from, from Poland. Some of them come here and open up the operations. They provide the services to of course, we have lots of refugees, female refugees in Poland. So they heavily entered the beauty sector and they are super successful here in Poland in the beauty, beauty sector. Transport companies are operating here from Ukraine. Construction companies enter the Polish market. Some of the producers are also entering and investing into their own sites. It's really a vast diversified process. So altogether, we have 30,000 plus Ukrainian companies started here after the full-scale invasion. Yeah, that really speaks to the power and influence of the small and medium enterprise sector. And it's a sector, frankly, that's not getting enough attention in terms of reconstruction and you know, thought and planning within Ukraine itself. It sounds to me like there's a vast reservoir of possibilities there when we think about Ukraine's economic future and the linkages that will exist between Ukraine and Poland will be very important. March, and I also wanted to congratulate you on being elected to the head of the EU-Ukraine Civil Society platform. Business associations, think tanks, chambers of commerce, our civil society groups play an incredibly important role in the economic ecosystem from our perspective here at SITE. Can you share some of the key goals and objectives of the platform and what it wants to carry forward in the coming years? Yeah, sure. The EU-Ukraine civil society platform monitors the integration process of Ukraine with the EU. Today, Ukraine has a status of a candidate country, and we are waiting the negotiations to be open soon. Once negotiations are open, the platform will change into EU-Ukraine joint consultative committee. So we'll be directly monitoring and having will we'll have an access to negotiations. Uh, the platform itself is located in the European Economic and Social Committee. So it's, it's the EU institution consisting of uh, social partners at the EU level. And we are doing our best to share the experiences of Poland and other countries in Central and Eastern Europe from the process of negotiations and integration with the EU. Even now, my organization, ZPP, prepares a large project on that. Uh, the project will target Ukrainian entrepreneurs and will focus on areas and sectors critical uh, to the future of accession negotiations. Also, the agricultural sector, because Poland joining the EU in 2004 had a very specific experiences in negotiations, the agricultural sector. Uh, transition periods this is all very important for institutions, for the way the country faces the integration process, and also the EU being uh, getting ready for the opening. So it's really essential right now to be active in this process. And again, we hope that later this year, uh, negotiations between the EU and Ukraine will open. Martian, it's been said, out of crisis comes opportunity, and based on all the work that you've been describing about the war in Ukraine, 
this crisis in the grain deal is driving people to be very creative and speed up some of these physical and bureaucratic integration efforts that, frankly, Ukraine's effort, um, neighbors have had problems in dealing with for years. I'm really hopeful that this will help open the Ukrainian border faster to the EU and to help harmonize its systems to make trade easier for the small and medium enterprise sector who really do have the key role to play here in the economic growth of Ukraine. It's really pleasing to hear that you and your colleagues are taking this leading role now in planning and actively working towards helping the SME sector and the agricultural sector in Ukraine begin its integration process into the EU. And I just want to thank you today for giving us a snapshot into that. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. We really see that hopefully Ukraine will use the access to the single market, which is now given to, to Ukraine temporarily, really for the sake of development of the companies, mainly SMEs. This is really important to diversify Ukrainian economy, not just to look at large players, but mainly at SMEs. We must accept that in some of the sectors in the accession process, there will be limitations, there, there will be quotas, transition periods involved, but that's okay. This is the way forward. But in a number of sectors, I'm pretty sure we can advocate to leave the single market open for Ukrainian companies for good. Thank you, Martin. And thank you for joining us on this episode of MOVA. To learn more about the Center for International Private Enterprise and our work, please visit our website at www.cipe.org. If you found value in this episode, please show your support by liking and subscribing to MOVA. Sharing this podcast with others also helps us expand the conversation. Thanks for listening. MOVA, the business language of the new Ukraine.